we're going to learn about how Michael has adopted and Fremont Bank have adopted Tableau, um, what they're doing with us with the data school, some of the challenges they're having, and how we can help you get around those. So, Michael, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Thank you, Andy. Thanks for uh, letting me share my experiences with your, uh, with your group. Uh, at, at Fremont Bank, we've been using Tableau for about uh, five years. I kind of drank the Kool-Aid back in 2015. <laughs> Uh, got excited, went to a couple conferences, missed the conferences quite a bit. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, we, we've been using it for our financial reporting and for a lot of the reporting that we do in our uh, mortgage origination area. Mm -hmm. And most recently, we'll talk a little bit about how we're using it to monitor the uh, digital engagement that our, our clients are having with our uh, new uh, online banking applications. Okay, great. Yeah, I missed the Tableau conferences as well. Uh, I went to the very first one in 2000 and 2008, and there were, I think, 200 people total, including Tableau staff. So it's, uh, it, it's quite different now. It's more like, uh, it's more like an event now than a, than a conference, uh, but it's, it's one of the few times every year you can see people that you only know virtually. Uh, so yeah, so um, you, you mentioned that you're using Tableau for doing some of the reporting within the bank. Um, do you use it primarily as a reporting tool or do you use it for analysis as well? I, I've kind of always thought that, um, at least because I started using Tableau so early on, that Tableau at its foundation is a data analysis tool that just happens to do dashboards. We now see a lot of people using it the other way around where you're using Tableau to build dashboards and then you might do some analysis. So where do you all sit there? Most of the stuff that we've been doing, especially the early adoption, was about uh, converting existing reports into visualizations. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people have been locked in on doing, you know, Excel and just, you know, beating the data to death with VLOOKUPs and those kind of things. <laughs> uh, that they have, they've gotten used to basically having, uh, I'll call them li listing type reports, mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of numbers, but they they're really not doing analysis. It's more about them being able to walk into a meeting and show uh, a statistical stance that you have at a, at a particular point in time. So from a reporting standpoint, okay. uh, a lot of what I was trying to do was get them out of having the raw numbers and just right. doing the visualizations and trying to do some trending too. Mm -hmm. um, more recently, uh, as we've been doing the stuff with our, our digital applications, uh, uh, the, our digital banking uh, applications, we're starting to do more analytics around the stuff, uh, trying to get, dig in a little bit more and see what type of people are, are using things, whether from a product mix or a, a, an age mix or, um, you know, frequency of use and, and, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of a, a crawl, crawl, walk, run type thing <laughs> where you, you start off by trying to convert existing Excel reports, exi existing listing yeah. reports, and then start migrating towards doing more of the uh, analytics side of things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I know with, uh, that's kind of the way I got started as well. A lot of it was Excel V lookups. And one of the challenges we found is that every time you email that spreadsheet to somebody else, they may change it. And then what's the source of truth at that point? So because you've, you know, you kind of started converting people, I guess one of the challenges would have been, how did you convince people that were the Excel users that were really, you know, oh, I'm this great person with V lookups and stuff that were doing this reporting. How'd you convince them to start moving toward the visualizations? That is a major, major challenge. Um, mm -hmm. I'll say that probably the thing that helped me along the most there, especially over in our mortgage origination area, was that we had somebody who had come from another organization who had worked on Tableau back in version four days. Okay. Uh, now, they were, they were in more of an executive position when they came to us, but they certainly had exposure to it. So right. when they were aware that we had Tableau, it was like, we need to start using this more. <laughs> so, and, and it was great because they were in the business unit. So as, uh, as that person helped me champion using the uh, reporting in that business unit, uh, it took a little while for some of the other executives to trust the data source yeah. because you know, so many times they're just going back to their staff and, and they're running their, their manual reports. Yeah. So it probably took, uh, I'd say, you know, eight, eight weeks, 10 weeks for, for the various managers to you know, try and poke holes in the Tableau reporting. But sure, once they got, sure. got comfortable with that, it, it was like, why, why are we using anything else? Let's, yeah, let's keep on yeah. going down that path. Yeah. So ha having that champion in, inside the department was, was major. I have tried to do it, uh, some of the report converting in our finance department. And 
uh, while the, the person who is preparing the reports is really likes the, the flexibility that Tableau offers. And we've, you know, played, you know, little what if games with, with her as we do stuff, trying to get the managers who use her Excel reports to transition over is, is just been a, a real challenge and I'm kind of mm. stuck there. So yeah. Um, yeah. Try, trying to get those guys converted is, is a, uh, is a challenge. So having that champion inside a, a department for me has been major. Yeah. It's uh, I think I've found that finance people are the hardest ones to convert because they just, they love Excel. Um, and uh, one of the biggest challenges that I've faced is convincing people that, yes, I know the numbers are right as you have them now, but again, as you pass them down the line, you know, it's like whisper down the lane, you know, it's not the same thing when it comes out the other end. So if there's this, you know, consistent use of the same data, everybody can use it for the same analysis. Everybody can build their own dashboards off of that. And it actually makes life a heck of a lot easier for everybody. But yeah, it's, it's tough to convince people of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Another, another thing, Andy, in, in that area is, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of being with the bank for 40, 40 plus years, had a wide range of experiences in, inside there. So inside the mortgage operation, as we were trying to convert them over to reports, I was able to kind of uh, insert myself into some of the email threads that the managers were passing around. So as mm -hmm. various business subunits were passing managers reports, I would see where there was duplication in those things. And I ended up creating a, a single dashboard that allowed them to measure performance across the organization. Mm -hmm. And once some of those, those people started to use that, um, they, they really enjoyed being able to have that, yeah. that single version. They could, you know, flip time, um, the visualizations, especially the, the dynamic side of it was, was really nice to mm. be able to allow the, the, the charts to flow as you could see uh, different individual workers rising to the top or falling, falling yeah. down uh, mm. off of per performance measures. So the, they, those, those are the kind of things that, uh, that the manager started to use more and more and, and knew that they couldn't do those kinds of things inside of Excel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, I was actually teaching a class here today at the data school about dashboard design. And uh, one of the key things I try to teach them is uh, about context. And every time you put something on a dashboard, you should be asking yourself compared to what, you know, and you need to know if it's good or bad. Is it improving? Is it, is it getting worse? That kind of thing. Um, so that's another challenge that you face when you're trying to migrate people off of, of Excel. Uh, you know, they'll have, they'll be doing their conditional formatting um, and all of that. So how do you all approach incorporating like context and comparisons to targets and things like that in your dashboards? A uh, couple things there. Uh, one is uh, I, I really like being able to use scatter plots and be able to have the, um, the reference lines in there. Mm -hmm. So I effectively create a magic quadrant yeah. where I have a, a reference line off of the X and the, and the Y. And mm -hmm. when I'm looking at uh, various individuals' performances or a certain product or something like that, um, it's easy for me to, to see if it's uh, in the far, in the upper right or right. The, the lower left or whatever, that, that type of stuff. The other thing that I've done is uh, I'll, I'll create, um, if I'm looking at, the, the workloads that, that, that people take on on a, on a day to day basis. Uh, again, I'll use reference lines in there so that they, you end up looking at how a individual is performing compared to peers uh, right. within the business unit. Yeah. Um, when, when it comes to trying to measure against uh, some kind of an outside standard, whether it's an industry standard or mm -hmm. possibly a budget or something along those lines, um, it, it's usually about trying to get an external source, being able to bring it into, you know, Excel or a CSV file, something that you can uh, pull in. Mm. And part of the challenges that I've found there is that a lot of times when people are creating budgets or you're getting an outside source, the, the, uh, the thing that you're trying to compare to doesn't, from a data standpoint, doesn't align perfectly with what you're, what you have in, in your actual data. Mm. So there's a lot of manipulation that you need to do to try and get the actual data and I'll call it the budget data or the comparative data aligned with, with themselves. Mm. But once you do that, uh, doing the, the, the reference charts works out quite well. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward at that point. But that, that then leads me kind of to my next question. Data prep is always 
probably a bigger challenge than uh, I, I would say we spend 80 to 90% of our time doing data prep and the rest doing analysis and design. Um, probably the same everywhere, if I had to guess. So you're talking about these external resources, or maybe it's even internal resources that uh, aren't really in the shape you need them in order to build the dashboard you need. And I know that when you've brought uh, data schoolers on, um, they've kind of helped you with that data preparation piece. Um, what were some of the challenges you were, you were facing um, uh, with your data prep, and how did the data schoolers you had there kind of help you overcome that? Well, one of the areas that we brought uh, data school in for was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've done a lot of work over on our mortgage origination side, but where we're bringing in deposits and where we manage our branches, and we've got about 25 branches, we didn't, we didn't have uh, any Tableau reporting on that side. So we, we brought in data school to try and get us off the ground over there, taking a lot of these finance Excel reports and trying to uh, convert them into something that was more uh, visual and, and trend yeah. oriented. So uh, first, first thing was trying to figure out of all of the different reports that the uh, departments were, were using coming out of different sources, what was the truth? Because yeah. what, what they had been doing was going into, uh, they were using a variety of Cognos reports to extract data and then dump it into Excel and then run, run their reports out of that. And the challenge was that, well, and, and over time, each, each Cognos report has got its own independent query. So when people were building uh, in um, calculations or filters, they were isolated within each of those independent Cognos reports. Right. And some of those reports had been built, you know, five years ago, we'd come out with new products. They hadn't gone in and made any edits to those things. Right. So right. you may have six or seven different Cognos reports that you're using as a source, but they're not all filtering or they're not all mm -hmm. extracting the data the same way. So this inconsistency uh, was a, a challenge. Now, bringing that in through prep cleaned, was able to clean a lot of that up. But when you're going through and doing prep for the first time and you're trying to validate the numbers, everybody in the, in the finance department or in the um, analytics department is going back to those original Cognos reports and saying, well, how come the numbers don't align? Right. And it really takes time to dig in and see, oh, here we were not including people who had been deceased in our numbers. And in this one, we never put that filter in. Or in some right. cases, we, we've got uh, test, test accounts that we have in the production side of the house. And we've got codes so we can isolate those things. And in some reports, they had eliminated the mm. test, the test accounts, others they didn't. So trying to really dig in and figure out what the uh, true source is, was a, a big challenge. And data mm. school helped us out a lot with that. That's um, good. So that was, that was prepping the, the actual data. Now, the, the corresponding piece that goes along with that is trying to create a comparison to a budget. So as I mentioned earlier, trying to align the financial budget with the, the data that was coming out of the actual system um, had its, its challenges as well. So we were able to, to, to do that and it took, took a couple of weeks and a couple of iterations to go through, but uh, Joe was really great in working through that stuff with me and uh, I worked with the finance department. And in the end, uh, we ended up with a, a handful of dashboards that we present to the board of directors on a, on a monthly basis now. That's great. So um, kind of stepping back from that, how'd you hear about the data school in the first place? You know, we're, you're based on the West Coast of California, um, eight hours different than we are. Um, so how'd, how'd you hear about the data school? Well, it, it all, it's all really come, comes back to the community. Um, you know, go, going to conference, learning about, you know, your contributions and, and many other people's contributions starting to follow some of the stuff, uh, you know, Tableau Tim has got his, his stuff yeah. out there. Um, I actually uh, en ended up reaching out to you for the, um, uh, what's the, the, the dashboard of all the dashboards. Visual vocabulary. There, the, yeah. The, yeah. The visual vocabulary piece. And yeah. uh, we had, we had a really casual conversation. I was, I was kind of surprised to be able to connect with you and was very ha happy to have the conversation. <laughs> not scary, I hope. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Now, now that I know you, um, but, <laughs> but once, once we started that conversation, uh, you know, I, I learned that your students were available, you know, in places other, other than the UK. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And so it, maybe it there's a marketing thing we need to be doing then is letting people know that, you know, we aren't limited to just the UK. You just, you just have to be okay with having a remote placement unless you want to pay somebody to go live there, but that's obviously not possible right now. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and remote and remote these days is all the fashion. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We started to pursue this relationship just, just as COVID was starting to hit. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and it was just, it's like, well, you know, Joe's not going to be able to come out on site or there's going to be all these limitations. I said, ah, makes no difference to me. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I'm in California. I've, I've got one, one of my developers is in Ohio. I've got another uh, developer in Texas. So yeah. I'm, I'm working remote with people all the time. <laughs> So how did you? So you've got a pretty um, dispersed team then. How do you how do you manage the the kind of time differences and stuff? Because that's a challenge. You know, the the more customers we start working with in the U.S. with our consultant space here in the U.K., we're going to run into more. Uh, you know, that's going to continue to be a bit of a challenge. So what are your recommendations for really anybody that's that's wanting to remote uh, to work uh, at a, at a big time difference like that? I think r- remote working in, in general. Uh, pe- people have got more flexible schedules. You know, it's not the not nine to five job or, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm online at 10 o'clock at night often, and I'm sure many of your staff are as, as well. Um, so being able to um, figure out how to work with people in different time zones is really not that, that big a deal unless I'm talking about completely the other side of the world. Right. Uh, but he, he, we, we, we have got relationships where we've got, you know, business partners over in, in, um, uh, in India, over in, in, in Pune, that, that we do work with, so it's not it's not unusual for us to um, be working uh, remote with with those folks. Yeah. But really, it's just it's just a matter of trying to figure out where schedules can can overlap. Uh, in the case of working yep. with uh, Data School, uh, we knew that we had about an eight hour differential between us, and it would allow us to have uh, our mornings uh, going up to say noon time for us would overlap with uh, London time going to maybe, uh, I think it's eight, eight o'clock in the evening, I think is what it worked out okay. to be. So pretty much what ended up happening is when we were working with Joe and then as we work with Tommaso now, um, their, their day is skewed a little bit. They right. start at about right. 11 o'clock in the morning and they run till seven, eight o'clock at night. Okay. Just adjusted, uh, yeah. Just yeah. adjusted a little bit. And, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm very flexible th- along those lines. So in terms of, you know, somebody wants to go to a concert in the evening or there's a birthday dinner they want to go to. It's just like, you know, let me know. We'll work it out. It's not a yeah. it's not a not a problem at all. Um, and it's worked out well, too, when uh, either Joe or Tommaso were conducting uh, video training of our branch staff as they were mm-hmm. just learning how to use the, the Tableau portal. Um, we just worked it out so that they they did it during our morning hours and, and your, your right. evening. hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, I've heard from uh, data schoolers that have had these kind of, uh, you know, sort of odd hour sort of relationships that uh, they actually find themselves really, really productive in the mornings because there's nobody at the customer on the West Coast to kind of interrupt them, right? So they're probably end up being a bit more productive because they do get that kind of focused time, you know, nobody's going to distract me, I can just bang out this project kind of kind of thing. So it's, it's interesting to, to hear you say that. So, um, so you've, you've had Joe and Tommaso. Um, and one of the things, I'm not sure how much people know about the data school, but it's the training part of the data school is only four months. And then they do four six month placements for us. Um, you might think, okay, well, how could they learn very much in, in four months? Um, so we often see, um, uh, I think the best analogy is you might see on LinkedIn that somebody has four years of Tableau experience. Well, really they have two weeks of Tableau experience, but they've done that two weeks for four years. So they've done the same task over and over again for four years. So really, they only have two weeks of experience. Um, so we try to go like really deep into both Tableau and Alteryx during that four months. How would you rate their skills uh, after four months in the data school compared to maybe, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to say your other staff, but maybe other people in the community and, and things that you've been able to observe, like, you know, are you getting what you think based on, uh, you know, when we first talked, you're like, okay, four months of training, you're probably like, well, I'm not quite sure what, mm-hmm. what I can get with somebody that's from four months. So tell me a bit, a bit about that and kind of what your experience has been with people having, you know, a, just a small amount of training time-wise. 
Uh, I, I was uh, I was amazed uh, at uh, what we got. You know, the the, the first couple of uh, reports that uh, I had worked with uh, with with Joe, mm-hmm. um, you know, we kind of threw out some basic ideas, and then it, as you say, he kind of went off in the morning and you know put his head to the grindstone and came up with a couple of ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the charts and the presentations uh, were were beautiful to be able mm-hmm. to look at. They were quick quick to grasp. Um, and in trying to show those to, to the managers, they, they all liked them immediately. Um, so the, the presentation was, they were clean, but the flip side of that was having worked with Tableau for a couple of years, I knew that the presentation, while it looked simple, was not simple into the covers. Right. And, and uh, the ability to, to put the, the filters on there or to be able to create, in, in our case we've got the the branches are broken down into like six uh core sub subgroups mm-hmm. so being able to create a dashboard that had kind of a matrix look to it where those six core were there was was a very simple thing in execution but right. again under the covers trying trying to get that to yeah, happen was, yeah. was tough another example that was uh, difficult in, for for me to try and execute on but uh joe and his training was was able to pull off was um, people who've been using uh, Excel, you know, they, they end up having multiple columns of, of stuff. It's just, you know, yeah. a, a very wide report and Tableau doesn't lend itself to being very wide. Yeah. Um, so he was using a technique to actually stack the data. Mm-hmm. So uh, for, for a given record, instead of actually showing the record, you put a, a, a pseudo record uh, up on, up on the, uh, the row and then you mm-hmm. use the labels to go in there and stick multiple data points inside of a label and the label mm-hmm. uh, shows shows across, which when, when I saw that technique, it was like, you know, I think I've seen this before. One of the <laughs> co- conferences, I don't know, maybe it was Stanky that was doing it or something like that, yeah. but it was like, yeah, that, that's that's a very good application for that. So uh, in, in that short window of time where they had their, their academic or theory side, he was able to turn that around and put it into practice pretty quickly. And it was yeah. pretty impressive. Okay. So, um, uh, if, if you were to recommend a data schooler to somebody, um, what do you think the best way would be for them to utilize their skills? Uh, well, I've had two, two schoolers at this point, and uh, my, my usage of them has really been about trying to expose them to some of the existing reporting that is being done through you know, PowerPoint or pivot yeah. tables and, and those kind of things and trying to uh, get them to convert that stuff into something that they think would be more representative. Um, you know, the, the, the data prep piece certainly needs handholding. Uh, mm-hmm. You can't really have an expectation that you're gonna bring somebody in from uh, an outside agency to be able to understand your data very quickly. They, they need to have a, a lot of handholding to go mm-hmm. along with that. Yep. Uh, but, but from a presentation standpoint, uh, being able to see what they're using as a starting point and then let, let them go through and try and be creative. Um, I'm, I'm under the impression from, from what I've seen from, from what both Tommaso and Joe have done, that they're exposed to a lot of different visuals while in yeah. class. And while they may see something that the bank has put out there, they'll, they probably recognize that that would be better represented by using this technique or that technique. Yeah. And I think yeah. that that showed itself in, in what, uh, what Joe and, and Tommaso have done so far. Okay. Well, that's good. Cause that's what I hope they get out of it. Cause that's what we try to teach them. So uh, yeah, we do a lot of teaching on, okay, this is how would you approach this particular data set? Uh, we talk a lot about um, how do you explore a data set when you have this type of data, what are the best charts to use? Um, you know, diff- different things like that. So, so that that's good to hear. Um, and during their training at the data school, uh, we do client projects, so we do we do projects for existing customers of ours to get them a bit of experience. Um, they, you know, they'll have like a project kickoff, work about you know uh, maybe about fifteen hours a week on the project, and then present back to the customers. They so get a lot of a lot of practice presenting, but one of the things that they have to do is they have to be able to basically learn a new business every week. Um, and I, I kind of equate it to like learning a new language because every company has their own ac- acronyms and every company says theirs are the most difficult to know. Uh, 
same for you all, I imagine. Um, how did you, how was it with them getting started with your business, kind of understanding the business and being able to then apply that to the things you were asking them to do? Um, when, when I first met with uh, Data School and talked with, uh, with Josh about the potential candidates, um, uh, I, I, I learned what their backgrounds were. Mm -hmm. uh, since this was my first exposure working with Data School and, and working with uh, outside source like this, mm -hmm. um, I, I tried to see if I could find somebody who had some finance exposure uh, and turned out okay. that Joe, Joe had uh, an econ under, undergrad degree. Okay. So, that, and helped, it, and yeah. it, so that, that, that helped quite a bit. So being able to uh, leverage that uh, was relatively straightforward for me. Um, the, 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 the language of uh, deposits and, and, and the, those types of things was not foreign to him. So it was okay. a, a really quick, okay. a really quick learn. Um, Tommaso's exposure has been completely different, which, okay. which for me was, was welcome the second time around because um, I want to be able to, now that I've got a, a little bit of um, a, a little bit of reporting under me, Tommaso can look back at that. And he's also got Joe that he can go back and talk to if he, if he needs to, mm -hmm. but he's also bringing a completely different perspective to yeah. things. So that, that was encouraging. And then Tommaso's background is, I don't know, was like electrical engineering and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. nothing to do with nothing related to and those economics. kind of things. So, yeah. 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 And, okay. and uh, I will say that one of the other things that was, that I thought was beneficial was that the, the, the mix of that you have there are, mm -hmm. are so diverse that, that that was something I thought was in, in, uh, going to be beneficial too. Um, if, if Joe or Tommaso have got got a particular quirk or or something that they're trying to to figure out, being able to lean lean on uh, fellow students and bounce ideas yeah. off, I, I thought was a really good thing. Yeah, yeah. Our company is designed basically to support the data schools. So we have our core consulting team and one of their primary responsibilities is to make sure the data school works. So we use, an, we use a platform called Convo that um, we don't really, we don't use email internally. Um, all of our communication is done through Convo and the default communication is to everybody. Um, so the, the, uh, the analogy that Tom Brown, our, um, the founder of the company uses is when you, when you start an email, the first thing you do is you exclude people by saying who you want it to go to. Um, and, you know, we've got so many great people that have gone through the data school that are in our core consulting team. Like, why wouldn't you want to share that knowledge and get multiple opinions from people? So we see questions from Joe and Tommaso, like, hey, I need help with this. I'm kind of stuck. Somebody will hop on a call with them in just a couple of minutes. So mm -hmm. um, I need to pause for one second because I just realized I didn't plug my laptop in and it's about to die. So just bear with me for a second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well. While while uh, while Andy's away, uh, I'll I'll say that some of the foundational stuff that uh, got me going with the data warehouse stuff was I I was starting to read some of Ralph Kimball stuff on on data warehousing and Stephen Few's uh, books on visualization. And once I started to see what those concepts were, and I got I think it was a marketing email from Tableau just to kind of see it. Um, and I started to play with the trial version. I was really surprised to see that Tableau was using so much of uh, Fuse uh, elements that the way he was always trying to focus on on bar charts and stay away from pies and the, co the color schemes and those kind of things. So those are the things that really attracted me into Tableau, having seen what the theory was and that they were putting it into practice and making it so easy to go in, into practice. Um, and after that, it was, you know, going through and seeing stuff by um, books by, by Andy and Eva or, um, you know, uh, Big Book of Dashboards, Practical Tableau. I mean, there's been a handful of documents that, that, that I've used as, as references and tried to learn from those and apply them. Great. Uh, sorry about that. Let me go back to share my screen. Oh, hang on one second share desktop one share okay so what happened to you on the video that would be good to know sorry i'm i'm uh, i'm doing this really well now aren't i uh well on my on my secondary screen i can see both of us so maybe i'm not being oh, okay up okay maybe maybe it's okay on the on the live stream 
Oh, nope. I can see my, my computer on the live stream. So just give me one second. I'm just going to stop sharing. Okay. So let me put this over on this screen and try it from here. Okay. Share screen. Desktop to share. Okay. And then I need to move this back over to desktop two. Okay. Sorry. I'm a, uh, my, I unplugged the wrong thing as well when I went to <laughs> when I went to start it up again. Okay, we should be good to go now. Um, okay. All right. So the yeah the the next question I had for you was um, uh, if you were to start all over again uh, in your maybe in your Tableau journey, what would you do differently? Um, in the in my Tableau journey and my my data journey, I think the, the big change for me would be when we first started building out our warehouse, um, I thought that because HR data is used throughout the organization, that would be a great place to start because it would be universal. Okay. Tur turns out the person that was my liaison in, in the HR department was really not interested in doing or sharing the information with others. So mm -hmm. while we built the warehouse and started collecting HR data back in 2013, um, trying to get it out and do reporting off of it was near impossible because anytime that HR was doing reporting, they wouldn't try and leverage any of the stuff. Mm. The second area that I went into was over on my commercial, commercial lending area. Uh, from a banking standpoint, on a quarterly basis, we try and analyze our portfolio and see where the risks are. And there's a huge report that they do around that. It's probably like 40, 40 to 60 pages worth of uh, analysis write up mm -hmm. on, on various loan categories. And they were excelling that stuff to death. I thought, boy, this is just ripe for being able to have the warehouse and, and some reporting. But again, what I ran into was the executive over there just was not really interested in doing anything other than uh, what was coming out of Excel, couldn't get him to migrate. So I probably went through, I don't know, probably two, two years worth of uh, effort there trying, trying over and over again to demonstrate to people, Here, here's your data, here's how I can present it to you, wouldn't you like to use it? And they just would not migrate. Um, I, I was finally able to get over to, to the mortgage operation where I had that guy who was the, the champion for me. And yeah. between the two of us, we were able to convert, convert them. So the, the, the biggest lesson for me was really trying to find somebody in the organization that is data driven and open to try and analyze the data that they have. Um, you may you may see an area that is ripe for opportunity, mm -hmm. but if you don't have somebody in that organization who is aligned with that or trying to to move forward, you're going to be going solo and you're going to be banging your head against the wall, which I I did for for a long time. Yeah, and it's it's much harder to get buy in then as well. Yeah. Um, so so would you uh, so you know you finally had the the champion in this one department. Would you spend more time initially trying to build relationships with people to become your champions in the different departments? I think it's it's that. I've also uh, I've got the, the area where Joe and Tommaso have been working right now over in our uh, community banking area, which manages all the branches and stuff. Um, ha having data school talent over there, we've been able to generate some re reporting. Mm -hmm. But aside from the executive in charge of the, the unit, trying to get that that champion level a little bit further down where it's a little bit more, you know, yeah. hand, hand, hands in the dirt kind of thing, they still have not been able to get that resource. So it, it's trying to cultivate with the executive, trying to cultivate who that champion is going to be or bringing that person in from the, from the outside. Um, you know, fortunately, I've, I've got the guy on the mortgage side. Uh, we recently, uh, the, well, recently, in the last four or five years here, we brought in a woman uh, over on our technology side, our, our chief data, uh, chief digital officer, who has uh, been a very pro uh, analytics. Uh, so, and we're still trying to find who that champion is going to be over in the finance area and who the champion is going to be over in the, the branching area. So, yeah, really trying to find find the person within or really make the executive understand that they need to go out and hire a person who's going to be that advocate for them. Okay, great. And uh, so as far as kind of resources, um, you know, you started using Tableau a long time ago, like I did. Um, uh, maybe a quick question about the community. Um, how do you use it if you do it all? 
Um, I'm, I'm on the receiving end of the community. I'm not actually giving back to sure, the community aside, yeah. aside from, from, from this. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are, are, are trying to tap into to users groups. You know, I started off by listening to podcasts. You know, em, Emily and Matt had their, you know, Tableau yeah. wannabe uh, thing that I, I listened to as often as it was coming out early on. Um, you know, going, going to conference. Um, more recently, um, you know, uh, Tim over at the data school there, Tableau Tim on on YouTube has been just wonderful stuff. I mean, he does really, really good pieces. Um, The other thing that I did uh, in the earlier days, this is probably about two years back, three years back now, but trying to have uh, brown bag lunches where I would go off to Mm. conference and because conference sessions were usually about an hour each, we would just, you know, bring in lunch for a handful of managers and uh, show them stuff, you know, the whole uh, steal like steal like an artist piece that Wexler yeah. and, and 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 those guys did, uh, which was uh, really good. So it, it was a combination of being able to tap into content that was either on on YouTube or podcasts or going to your local tug meetings. Um, just just trying trying to learn as much as you can from from those di- different resources. Okay, great. Um, so. Speaking of the, uh, one of the things that, that we used to do when I worked at Facebook, speak, you know, you mentioned your brown bag lunches is every uh, once a month on a Friday, we would just have a showcase where people could come in and, and kind of show things they built. Maybe it inspires some other people to do things. Um, what are some of the things you do internally to kind of share ideas between different departments? Like, you know, here's something cool I built. Maybe you can leverage it, something like that. Do you have like an internal Tableau user group, maybe? We we don't have an internal Tableau user group because there's mm-hmm. probably about four or five of us that are actually built building reports and including, you know, our yep. data school author. So we have done some, sh- some sharing. Uh, we need to get better at that. Uh, I-, I think I would like to try and resurrect the, 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 the brown bag lunch stuff. We have spent a little bit of time trying to do some standardizations around dashboards. Uh, one of the things that we've come up with is, uh, you know, kind of like the, the look and feel of what, the Fremont Bank template looks like from yep. a, a brand branding standpoint, but also simple things like um, we usually create a, a, a tab in the dashboard that is like it's almost like an, an about page. So it's it's uh, really a, it's a, a dashboard page that's really nothing but text, but it's really giving you the backstory on what that dashboard is about. Uh, and that way, if you're mm-hmm. uh, just a, a regular manager from a different department or something like that, you can consume the. You can consume the dashboard part of it if you want, or you can look at the tab that's about and you can learn, well, this is where the data is coming from. This is what it means. This is the purpose behind it and those kind of things. So we've tried to create a couple of those, those, those kind of standards, but there's, um, for, for me, they're still, they're still too, too isolated. They're not, they're not uh, mm-hmm. uh, brought, brought together very well yet. Okay. Um, what would be your top maybe two or three go-to resources for people that are just starting using Tableau. Um, I ask because one of the things that I recommend is the Tableau Starter Kit on Tableau's website. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever seen that or, or heard of that, um, but what would be maybe the top two or three things that, uh, that you would recommend to maybe new employees or different, um, you know, whoever, if they asked you, you know, how can I get started? What are the best resources for me to use? The starter kit is, uh, I haven't been to the starter kit, but the way that I started and the way I encourage others to, mm-hmm. to do it was just to go to the, to, to the learning side of Tableau's website. Yep. And it's, it's probably what the starter kit has evolved to now, yep. but it was yep. just a series of you know five, five or 10 minute little snippets about particular functionality. And uh, you know, some of it's uh, just basic, basic stuff and some of it was getting more advanced. So Go, going in there and doing doing pieces. Um, mm-hmm. Tableau has got their uh, their own certification programs now. The, that uh, e learning center uh, type thing, which uh, one one of our our uh, workers has uh, started doing that. So that was a a, a, a very relatively cheap way of going in there and, and learning. Um, the other pieces is, is actually going out to to YouTube and, and seeing stuff. Yeah, like, there's so much like stuff Tim, on there. Now. Tim does. Yeah, there's so there's so much stuff that's 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 out there, and uh, again, they're they're not long. Um, and then and then the final piece is you know being able to go out to some of the pieces that that uh, com- conference produces. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention you know uh, you know 
Emily doing the, uh, the, the fringe festival and yeah. being able to have so many people from outside uh, put together little 20 minute snippets on, on a mm -hmm. wide variety of topics. And, and those topics aren't always just about the mechanics of Tableau. Sometimes they're, uh, they're about, you know, getting women more involved in analytics and it's right. more, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, about the, the whole analysis segment, not, not so much about the tool itself, but um, mm -hmm. that, that was Emily's to be commended for putting that together. And it's been really, really fun. That's great. I'll, I'll pass along the word to her. I have a, I have a WhatsApp chat with, with her and Matt where we're giving each other a hard time all the time. So, uh, yeah, poke, okay. poke them in the ribs. They haven't done a podcast in a while. I tell them that all the time. I will remind them again. Um, <laughs> uh, they even came up with a new logo too, but, uh, yeah. So, um, I guess maybe maybe this will wrap this up with our last question. We've got about two minutes to go. Um, how do you ensure that your team can uh, continues to learn and be challenged? That's that's a good one. Uh, well, part of it part of it is um, as I bounce between the the various team members, I share with them stuff that I have learned either from mm -hmm. from them or from data school. Okay. Uh, the other thing is making sure that they well in the past making sure that they had an opportunity to go to conference. I didn't want to be the only one going to conference and, um, you know, having to bring back stuff with my bias uh, right. uh, towards whatever the data was, you know, they're going to go, go to someplace like that, bump into people from different industries, come out with completely different perspectives. And I thought that that that's one thing that I, um, I miss quite a bit about conferences that that exposure you get to so many different people and so many different uh, in industries. Yeah, so, yeah. uh, I, I, I've always tried to take, uh, as big a team as I could there for, for me, that was, you know, three or four people. Yeah. Uh, but still yeah. it, to, to me, the price was well worth the, the exposure of getting there and understanding what the tools capabilities were and yeah. realizing that there were a variety of resources out there. There wasn't just me as a resource or YouTube as a resource. Yeah. There were the tugs and everybody else. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time, Michael. Um, it's been it's been a pleasure chatting with you and seeing you again. Um, hopefully, you keep working with us. <laughs> You're enjoying the the, the people working with you. Um, any final words for the audience? No, just share. Share is pro probably the, the the biggest thing. That's what this community is, is uh, grown about, and um, it's the way I've been able to learn, and I'm sure you're going to learn the, the same way. So, to the degree that you learn something, share it with your peers or um, you know, if you're up to it, put it out on YouTube. Great. Or a blog. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure catching up. Thank you, Andy. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.